it's increasing <laughs> the number of participants. Wow. We are at 112, actually. Already a very good number, I think. Yeah. Well, we can wait just one minute more, maybe in case, uh, and then we... Because 15 minutes, go enough quick so very quickly yeah uh, it's enough quick so Okay. And I see that there is two people asking for something. George Pires Peña, say hello, good morning for us. Marianne Mackey, hello. Nico, hello. Right, hello to everybody. Okay, now uh, we have some more from Portugal, from uh, Tarragona, from Ukraine. Okay. I got we should start. Yes, whenever you're ready. Uh, okay. We my co my dear colleagues, we can go. Yes? OK. Um, so uh, I would like to, to welcome uh, all the participants to this meeting, the speaker, of course, uh, but also uh, all the uh, persons that are connected to see this online symposium, this NOVT symposium online, uh, facing COVID-19. Uh, we, we have tried to do a, a short program of two hours uh, just to see how the world has react uh, face to, to this uh, trouble and how uh, we can uh, organize the thing, especially for the vine and wine uh, uh, production. Uh, we are thinking, of course, to the winery, but also to the research, to the formation and uh, all the, uh, the different parts that can be uh, uh, touched by, uh, of course, the, the pandemic. Uh, the program uh, includes, in fact, uh, one speaker that is Dr. Marianne Matke from Stellenbosch University of South Africa, um, Miguel Fuentes and Ruben Perez uh, from Ceresco in Spain, 
Uh, we have also myself work, uh, concerning the disinfection. Uh, Professor Liliana Martinez, that is uh, in fact in Argentina, in the University of Cuyo. Professor Vittorino Novello, that is in the University of Torino. Um, and then we will have Professor Zanzudai from the Chinese Academy of Science in Beijing, in China. Uh, and to finish, we should have Professor Andrew Waterhouse from the University of California, Davis. It's very early in California, and this is probably the reason that she, he will connect uh, a little bit later. Um, and then we will have done a turn, uh, maybe not of all the, the country, because in two hours, of, of course, it's not possible. But uh, we will have some uh, uh, different vision about uh, uh, what we can do uh, facing COVID-19. So I would like uh, again to thank uh, all of you, uh, especially the, the speaker, of course, uh, for organizing and be there because it's late in some place and early in some other. I want also to uh, thank uh, Agat uh, and the NOVT team who has organized the meeting. And I hope that uh, everybody can enjoy this, this meeting. Uh, so we can begin. The first speaker is uh, Dr. Marianne McKay from Stellenbosch University. And she will talk about opportunities and challenges of online teaching in the field of viticulture and enology. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you very much. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here all the way from, from South Africa at the bottom end of Africa. So good afternoon to you. Um, I'm Marianne Mackay. I'm a lecturer in enology and my research specializations are smoke taint in wine and, uh, and teaching and learning. I will be accompanied and in fact my colleague Talita Fenter um, is a lecturer in viticulture to talk about the viticultural aspects and she has um, a research specialization in vineyard scale characterization of plant performance. So we will be talking about our teaching at, at Stellenbosch and Talita is moving the slides. So please forgive me if I say thank you Talita at the end of, of various slides because that's, that's how we're going to organize it. Thank you Just Talita. Just a quick question. Thank you. Can you see the slides? Because my thing has just disappeared a bit. <laughs> yes. Can you see? Yes, I can see the slides on my screen. I can see also. If you could move on, Talita, that would be great. Anyway, while, while this lives, there we go, that's the slide. Um, we are from the University of Stellenbosch, which is based in uh, Stellenbosch in South Africa, in the heart of the Cape Winelands. Stellenbosch it has 35,000 students, um, around 5,000 staff members across 12 faculties, and there are 2,500 students generally registered per year in agri-science, which is the faculty that we are in, in. Our students are quite a diverse group, um, previously, off, uh, Stellenbosch was an Afrikaans, very conservative Afrikaans university, but it's recently been embracing, embracing decoloniality de and, and obviously starting to expand its student group, which means that we have a very diverse set of students, which brings its own, own uh, challenges. Uh, the COVID-19 COVID, uh, impact was huge. We were, we were told in the middle of March by the university uh, to move immediately to uh, emergency remote teaching um, across the board in all faculties, across all curricula with no, with no excuses and no quarter given. So it was, a big, it was a big shock for us. Could you move on please, uh, Talita? What we've decided to cover today is, is a very brief presentation on some of the major aspects of teaching um, uh, teaching online, succeeding in teaching online, what's important for that, um, how important communication and support is, and some of the challenges and rewards that, are, that, uh, that we've experienced in this time. And I'm going to hand over now to Talita to talk about rethinking the delivery of standard modules in, in, in Ology and Viticulture. Thank you, Marianne. So basically the theory part of the curricula is obviously the, the part that is the most simple to 
uh, change to an online format. Um, we just had to think how we're going to restructure our delivery. And we've already had this um, platform available that we just had to rethink how are we actually going to use it. And then we also had to think about the students themselves and aiding them in time management, which we've realized is actually quite a big problem with the, the current generation. So we decided to then chop our curriculum into doable sections on a weekly basis and then standardize the delivery of that and say by this date which is usually Friday of the week you need to complete the following this is the material that you need to work through these other assessments or the um, progress gauges that you need to um, com well, comply with and then obviously we also have to think about asynchronous and synchronous um, uh, delivery because we as Marian's mentioned we've got different students who come from different backgrounds and don't have the infrastructure available to necessarily uh, continue the synchronous activities online so we were actually basically told to rather focus on an asynchronous way of delivery for the theory part and now we get to the second semester especially in in viticulture as well where we start to to plan practical activities around online learning and we have to decide whether certain activities are actually uh, possible in the online space and if not how are we going to adapt our um, previously arranged assessments um, in order to still uh, match the outcomes of that module and then also just touching on assessments we have to think which ones can be transferred directly online so something like a quiz or a tutorial is very easy to conduct online but you have to do a formal evaluation such as the test or a exam that becomes a little bit more tricky because we also have to think about the academic integrity and making sure that we think outside of the box to to prevent um cheating and all kinds of other uh, things from from sneaking in so yeah i think one thing that we've made a lot more use of now is to use formative assessments which are short quizzes where students can gauge their progress and we can also gauge their progress we can see how much time they spent online so that's really um i think the benefit of having gone the the online route and on the next slide we just quickly see a um, example from what we call grapevine sciences 344 that is a third year second semester module and specifically the point i want to um, emphasize here is the pruning of grapevines so the theory has been covered in the first semester already but now we have to we would usually have practical sessions in the vineyard and we have industry visits but now that is obviously possibly not going to happen uh, so we must think can this be done online can we rework it in the form of a video or a um, interactive video or photo tutorial was that not possible um, and we've also got another plan to actually extend the timing um, of pruning sh um, shifting it out later in the season, which is of course not ideal for the vineyard. Um, but if we've got a vineyard that we can to a degree sacrifice uh, to still make this possible, then we'll have to um, consider that. Or do we then shift it to the following year in the fourth year program? So there's a couple of things that we need to think uh, regarding that. And things like canopy management, also quite a, a lot of practical activities that need to be completed for the assessment but that is likely going to be later in the growing season. So by that time, we should have the students um, back on campus and be able to continue as, as normal. And now Marion will just discuss um, an example on the, on the analogy side. Yeah, in analogy, you can, what the point of this slide, and I'm not going to spend any time on it at all, is just, is just to look at the left-hand side, which is the blue columns compared to the emergency remote teaching. And you can see that the intensity and the, and the number and the volume of online content in order to scaffold the learning is so much more in online. And initially I went a little bit aboard, over, overboard with scaffolding and I got a very uh, terse feedback from the students saying that it was too much and they couldn't cope and, and I, had to, I had to scale back my, my teaching a lot. Um, the health and safety legislation, which is bold in the left-hand corner, Usually we would have done that in a winery. We would send the students out to a winery and they would work through the health and safety issues with a winemaker and do an audit of a winery. And, and now I had to think of an online um, exercise. And so I decided to ask them to write a, a health and safety plan for a small, or a small winery. They found it very, very challenging. But what was wonderful was the feedback and the interaction around it. And I realized that it was actually better than the other than, than the normal classroom, classroom lecture and practical methods. So, so yeah, thanks Talita. 
Okay, so now we're going to look at the succeeding in online teaching. So what is the essential um, needs and what, what is out there that makes this task easier for us? So if you're looking, uh, obviously infrastructure is very important and because we've got diverse candidates under our student group, uh, that's not always possible. We've got students who don't have access to basic things like electricity or ample working space in the home environment. Um, devices are often limited to only having a smartphone and also there's issues with connectivity and, and, and funds available for, for data. So the university did a lot of work in compiling surveys to gauge where in what position does each student within each faculty find themselves and then there were um, processes of loaning laptops um, and also to ensure that they can supply data bundles to students in need. So I think we've, we've really stepped up to the plate in making sure that no one is uh, left behind in this transition to the online format because it was basically forced upon us and the student wasn't out of their own free will to make this decision. So learning platforms that, as the ones we've got that we'll discuss a little bit later are a great um, key to making this a success, um, it's, but it's not necessarily a necessity. So with Microsoft Office and Teams, Zoom, WhatsApp, um, audio visual applications online that are available freely, you can get very far in the online teaching space. Um, the thing was we had to rethink, as we've already said, the way we produce or um, convey this information. And there the university also put in a lot of effort with the Center for Teaching and Learning, um, giving us webinar series for both um, for the staff, especially to work with skills development and how to use these platforms. And then having guidelines and help desks available on the student side as well to, to assist them. So we had to think out of our comfort zone and come up with new creative ideas of how to do this. And we also um, encouraged the students to be creative in the assignments that they uh, submit to us and, and being flexible. So if someone is not able to do a Word document, they can write it on a piece of paper and upload a photo um, as long as we can see what, what's going on. So really, this was a, a time of being creative. I personally enjoyed it a lot because it gave us a little bit of freedom and it made it challenging, but it was it was very rewarding and as Marion said the general feedback we got from students was good they saw the effort that we put in and they were quite amazed at what we were able to put together in quite a quite a short period of time and it's also we need to be patient with both ourselves and the students that's very important it's um, difficult in the online space it can feel very lonely and isolated so you, know, you still have to try and bring the the human element into this uh, one of the things we realized was that collaboration and consistency was really important. Collaboration with colleagues, we worked with them a lot, um, not just within our, our own modules, but across across the university with the, the colleagues in teaching and learning and with the colleagues in the Center for Learning Technologies. Um, there was a lot of collaboration and the availability of the of the platform. Um, we were very we were very lucky. And I think Talita, you can move on to the next slide. Uh, we had a we had a, a an existing online platform that was adapted by Stellenbosch University from Moodle. Um, it went through various incarnations over the years, but it it ended up being called SunLearn, and it was seriously underutilized by everybody. And and but but what we realized as part of this was that even though we had a Boeing 747 um, available to us, you didn't actually need a Boeing 747 to get from A to B with your teaching. What you needed was just the skills to be able to fly a little bit. So, so our message, my message from this slide is that, you know, having a wonderful, powerful platform like SunLearn was great and we were really lucky, but it wasn't absolutely necessary because a lot of students ended, a lot of lecturers ended up doing quite simple techniques to get across their, their learning. Uh, Talita, could you move to the next slide, please? This is just an example, one page of my module, Wine Science 214, where I'm, I can, I'm just showing how, how simply it's laid out. It's, it's very, very clear what the deadlines are. It's very clear what needs to be done. Well, I think so anyway. And, uh, and it's not complicated. So the interventions don't, can be quite straightforward um, as long as there are clear, concise instructions and students know exactly what's expected of them. Thank you. So we find ourselves at this stage in a very uncertain time and I think uncertainty breeds anxiety. So 
a way of countering this is to to have clear and effective communication and support channels available. So mm -hmm. we've had a lot of the big decisions being taken on the institutional level. So especially like regarding the strategy to uh, or the decision to go fully online. And we are now currently in a decision making process of when are we going to have students returning back to the classroom? Is it going to be at the start of the second semester or only later? And we're trying to push for an umbrella decision um, to make it less uh, uncertain and daunting for the students as well as for staff. Because if we have to plan for plan A, B and C, that breeds a lot of anxiety. Um, unless we know, uh, as opposed to knowing exactly what, what the road ahead is, is going to be like. So yeah, so with the students, there's a lot of official communication channels which were um, conducted through to the university and also from the lecturer side. But we also have to make sure that we don't bombard them with, with communication. Things need to be clearly set out, standardized, um, and also just keep them on their toes and um, don't wait three weeks in between communication. Just, just keep checking in on the students. And obviously with colleagues, um, as we said, it was very important to, to collaborate and um, to ask for help because we are all in the same boat uh, and a lot of us can, can share skills and tips that we've um, learned along the way. Uh, if I could just go to the next slide, which it does not want to do. There we go. Um, so if we're looking at this little table, the green, uh, ticks in green blocks basically refer to um, institution communication. So there was a lot of um, uh, information put out and communicated to us. And then I feel on a personal level, it was almost up to the staff uh, or the lecturers to try and um, reassure the students uh, helping them to find the, and maintain balance in, in working from home, um, how, to, how to get through their work, etc. And then what we've also found that um, later on we realized that communicating with the students specifically about academic integrity, that is very important so that they understand that we are still giving them a good quality education and we need to be, um, it needs to be reliable. Later on we also picked up that there is a certain level of anxiety. As Marianne said, they became overwhelmed. They felt that the workload was much more than would have been in a normal face-to-face -face, um, situation. So we picked up on that maybe a little bit late, but we then like jumped to it and tried to, to um, accommodate students in certain ways by extending deadlines, et cetera. And then information on well-being, uh, they are only looking at staff well-being right now. So the way we feel is we've had a lot of support for the students but not necessarily for, for staff members how do we deal with that anxiety how do we deal with maintaining a balance so it's a very difficult time for everyone Talika? i think it has frozen oh. <laughs> um, actually go. while talita there we go um, what we're going to do now very quickly is have a look at some of the, the, the challenges and rewards um, that we, from data that we gathered from our, our colleagues within the department and how, uh, things that we found ourselves. Um, this, this looks at the challenges and one of the main ones was how to meet the outcomes for viticulture and enology in a new way. Um, that, that, was a, that was really people having to be creative and think outside of the box. And it was, it was great because, uh, in, in one way, which I'll talk about in the next slide. But the blurring of the office, work, home, childcare, school line was a big problem for parents and for people with families. Um, we possibly expected too much of our students and too much of ourselves. Um, and another massive challenge was learning the technology, learning how things work at a, at a click level um, within SunLearn. So those were some of the major ones. And then the rewards were that mastering the tools, rethinking the teaching, finding new ways and finding and developing great material which can be used going on into the future for, for meeting outcomes in viticulture and enology, which was fantastic. And in my case, I, I saw that some of the learning uh, from the students was even better than I normally get. The students actually said, and I've got some quotes here very quickly, I had to work harder on my own and it helped my, to ensure my understanding at a much deeper level than previously. Um, it was much more challenging with assessments as you had to understand the work and not just give facts back like in a test 
and I was very satisfied with the online learning platform. It was a massive adjustment, but I found the setup of everything really held you accountable to stay on top of the work. So that, that was some of the feedback that we got. Thanks, Talita. Then we just wrap up with some final remarks is that uh, the practical subjects like viticulture and oenology are definitely um, challenging to present in an online format, but the positives definitely outweigh the negatives. Um, and we are very lucky to have our Boeing uh, <laughs> of an online platform um, and also that excellent support group from the Center for Teaching, Learning and Center for Learning Technologies. It's a great group of people who are very skilled and have put in a lot of effort with the webinars for us. We are not at the end of the challenges yet, especially as I've mentioned in the viticulture section, there's quite a lot of um, season specific um, practical aspects that need to be addressed and how do we do this. But the feedback has been overwhelmingly positive and we're ready to continue and, and give it our best and, and continue on what I think is a, a good wicket at this stage. So our acknowledgements, I would like to thank the organizers of the symposium for the, um, for the opportunity to present today. And then also for Prof Professor Vessel de Toué, Prof Professor Marie de Toué, Dr. Deborah Rousseau, Professor Benoit de Waal, who contributed to this um, presentation. Any thank questions? Thank you very much for letting us present. Thank you very much. Uh, so, um, Marianne, uh, uh, it was uh, very interesting and we can see that there is a lot of challenge uh, for teaching online. I don't know if there is some question. If there is, uh, people can, uh, can ask. They can write if they want. They can always email us as well if they're, if they're interested in any particular aspects. Okay. It's quite an intimidating environment to answer, to ask questions in, I think. <laughs> yeah, we need to, to learn also uh, how to, to uh, manage, in fact, this, uh, this system because uh, we are not uh, formed for this. I see that there is at least one question. Uh, so Andrei Tarasov is saying, thank you very much for the presentation. Do you think there are differences in the tools and methods for conducting online lecture for small up to 20 students and large group of students? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, the, the, our colleagues in chemistry, biochemistry, physics, maths are dealing with very large groups of students and they are using different tools. They will be using MCQs, and, and quite quick and fast m online methods. We have smaller groups of students, so I was able to ask the students for reports and for, and for, for plans, but yes, absolutely, there would be different, there would be different ways. Um, and it would be, depend on the, on the platform that you have, um, what you would have available to use, but, but uh, you cannot expect a thousand students or a, a lecturer to mark a thousand, a thousand health and safety plans for, for a winery. It's, it would be impossible. So, so yes. Another question that's here is, could you replace successfully the viticultural aspects with videos? I think that's one for Talita. Yes. Yeah. Um, I've been thinking about this a lot. Uh, I do think it is possible, but it also once again depends on the, the tools that you have available. So if you are, I'm thinking specifically with the pruning, I'm thinking about doing either video tutorial where I carry it out um, and they have to, students have to then comment on whether everything was done correctly or not. Um, but that obviously depends on whether you can get the video to be clear enough for them to see the, the smaller actions. And then also to try and do a flipped classroom um, approach where they actually become the lecturers. So they have to, if you do it in a tutorial format, uh, where they perhaps have to, if they've got the ability, go to a vineyard or even use something like a rose bush or Bogan Villa that's got uh, nodes and, and auxiliary buds uh, and do some pruning and explain um, the process. So, yeah, it's me thinking about a couple of ideas and I, I think it. It can work, um, but it's going to take a lot of thought and effort and with the, the limiting time to make this happen, we'll, we'll have to see, but I'll let you know if we manage. Okay, uh, uh, a last one and then we will move on because time is running. 
So Arina Antonse is asking, uh, thank you for sharing your experience. Can you tell us how was managed in the end the practical application, laboratory work especially? We were lucky this semester in, in Enology in that the, um, we had already done some of the practicals as part of our, our harvest runs from, from February. It's around February, March. So we had started the semester and done quite some, of the some of the practical aspects with the third year students. Um, but then we, what we did was we designed a a practical exam which concentrated on the student's understanding of the technique. So, for example, if they were being asked about sulfur dioxide additions, it would be, it would be a question about existing wine with a certain sulfur dioxide level and what about the adjustment and how would you... So, so we tested the understanding of the practical application. We were hoping to be back um, in the second semester to be able to carry on some of the more um, uh, laboratory based uh, things, but we're going to have to rethink that because the university has just told us we won't be back till 20, 21st of September with some of the practical modules. So that's going to make it quite challenging, but there are ways that you can address it with very, very clever questions. And then, of course, we just have to postpone out some of those aspects until next year or until the COVID crisis. Is, uh, is over. Thank you for the question. It's a good one. Okay, thank you very much. So we will have to move on if there is a question. I think that the people can send you email uh, because uh, as a way we will be very late. So uh, next speaker is uh, Miguel Fuentes from Ceresco and he's talking about uh, robotics and technology to preserve tradition. So Miguel, thank you for uh, your presentation. So, um, I'm going to share my presentation. Okay. Uh, good morning. First thing, I would like to thank Onoviti for inviting us to give this talk and um, all the people who have joined this presentation. Uh, Ceresco is a company in the IT sector. In today's session, we are going to tell you about our vision of how technology can help the primary sector to preserve the tradition, how it can help to be more productive and sustainable with the best possible possible quality. Um, at these times where social distancing measures are so important, having help to make decisions before going to the field is, is essential. Um, well, uh, I'm going to make a brief presentation of my company from Ceresco, if I don't, my boss get mad. So, Ceresco is a company of about 700 professionals, most of them software engineers. We are 50 years old, that for an IT company is uh, a lot of time. And the area in which I'm working has been developing software on issues related to the aero sector for more than 30 years, mainly for the government in software for the management of payments from the CAP, the, the Common Agricultural Policy. Uh, we have also developed a specific products. Uh, a couple of months ago, we launched Bayabaca. It's like something like, uh, I don't know what, what the cow or something like that. It's a virtual market for live animals where uh, almost 1,000 people have signed up in a very short time. With, with this COVID pandemic, livestock market were closed. And it was a very useful way to connect livestock sellers and buyers. It, it's been a great su success. If you are interested, uh, just try buyabackup.com. Um, well, for a few years, we been working on a precision viticulture product called, called Cultiva Decisiones. Well, yeah, actually, also is used in many other crops like uh, corn, wheat, red fruits, sugarcane, um, oil palm, I think so, yeah. Well, when we think about how it, would, it was done in the past, the farmer 
went every day to the vineyard, look at the sky, and based on his intuition and experience, he was making decisions. He has his land, worked always the same way, he applied, uh, applied the same amount of fertilizer or phytoproduct. Um, well, in, uh, over time we have been seeing how technology was incorporated in some way, but the vast majority sim simply access to their local weather service and perhaps are in a WhatsApp group where they exchange photographs of stained leaves with mildew or hail damage. Um, well, it's working, but uh, not enough. In more professional environments, uh, wine growers use sensors in the field, some also access some satellite service such as Sentinel or higher services from drone flight companies to obtain indicators from the, uh, the NDPI or the MSI, the, the Humidity Stress Index. Uh, and with them, they can see that the terrain is not homogeneous and they, that they ha may have to treat it di uh, differently. Because uh, by doing the same things in all your vineyard, we unify the, the quality and we may miss something special that we can we could get from a specific area. Uh, I have read some studies about it and the prof, uh, profitability of production, taking in, uh, into account the the viability of the of the terrain. Uh, well, we, our product cultiva we hear your reference on the areas and um, allow us to group all the data to, in a single point. It's like uh, concentrate in, in only one app everything about your, your crop. Uh, that's a sample of one screen. You can see all the uh, variability management zones, the, all the data related to each zone. Um, all the information of our crops is always integrated here. Um, well, we also collect meteorological data from different sources, from private sensors or public networks, or even virtual sensors. Um, this is an example of well, we can what can we do? Um, we store the data forever and show it on our software. Um, we can see the information of the data that we want in numerical, graphical mode, uh, individual, aggregate. It's like uh, having everything here. And um, we can uh, check, uh, we, we can uh, have extended information about the, the sanitary state of our, our area. Um, well, I, I'm not going to show you the probe, just give some examples of what can we do with all this information. In this case, for example, uh, for the grape, it's important to know that the, the zone of average temperatures of the days during the active period and depending on the grapes and um, variety, it may take to take up to 4,000 hours. And we can use the real data. We can measure the average temperature and display it in a software and, and even compare its evolution with pre previous, previous years. The, this can help you plan the potential time uh, for harvesting, for example. Or uh, if we are collecting the, the, cli the climate information, if we know that the factors that affect the development of mildew are humidity, temperature, and leaf humidity, we can develop models that warn the farmer of the probability that it will be developed 
and facilitate his decision making. We send alerts by, by email. Uh, for example, this model was uh, developed in a collaboration with the Mission Biológica de Galicia. Uh, and it's in this case is yeah it's for milli well um maybe the the model is saying that uh treatment should be applied next friday but the forecast is for rain so better do it another day maybe we can also check the spray window to do it when there's no wine so that the product is not carried away. Um, well, um, technology can also help us to take measurements in the field and based on models, uh, automate some things. For example, uh, obtain early estimates of yield. In this case, we can plan the, the people we need to make the harvest, how many trucks, the yield we will need to store or we can measure acidity, pH, sugar, and the, shop, uh, the software can show us ripen and curves to know, for example, when is the best harvest time based on the one we want to obtain, of course. Um, well, there's been a lot of talk about precision farming, but lately we've been talking a lot too about measurement farming. The data are very important. It's possible that we are storing information today that we do not use, but that may be a great help in, in the future. So um, we, we store uh, everything um, that we can. Well, uh, at the end, we, we have uh, a lot of data, images, drone flights, sentinel images, um, at Cultiva, we offer the way to see everything combined. We try to give all the information to the wine grower so that they can make the, the best decisions. We can see all the Sentinel lawyers and play with the opacity. We see how the, the vigor of our terrain has evolved, uh, superimposed measurements that um, we may have taken, such as the crop load the number and weight of clusters can give us many clues of what's happening. Or for example, if, well, if we have some insect traps uh, around the vineyard, uh, we can see how an increase in population affects and well, can help the, the, the wine grower to make decisions. Um, well, Ceresco, our company, I already said that we were computer engineers and we like to design beautiful applications with graphics, uh, crossing da data, integrate with other applications and devices, the, the, these words like the IoT, the Internet of Things. But to improve our project, we need, we seek collaboration with uh, universities, research centers, wine growers, of course. Um, well, we just we have just present some proposals in H twenty twenty with some consortiums. Onovity has asked us to talk about it. Of course, the project have just been submitted, and um, I can talk much about them. But for example, we just intro introduced an initiative to apply robotics to improve production. The project is called Flexi Robot, and the idea is to combine the, the aerial information that comes from satel uh, satellite or drones or from field sensor with information that is obtained from an autonomous robot that contributes. Uh, intelligence to the da data that is obtained. Uh, for example, mm, th there's a case for disease, disease detection. Um, but the interest of the project is also that the same autonomous robot 
can be used in different missions, not only in specific tasks such this uh, uh, disease detection, but at the other time it can collaborate, for example, I know in the transport of the grape. Uh, well, it's not about making robots replacing the one grower or the field technician. It's about having a close, close source of information that uh, allows you to make better decisions um, using uh, objective data. That when you go to the field, you have already done this previous work that allows you to be more pro productive and in a safer environment. Well, we are also in another consortia, the Artificial Intelligence for Sustainable Agriculture in the Atlantic area, where we will try to reduce the impact of agricultural activity on the environment, trying to analyze special vari variability and providing Side the specific needs of nutrients and recommendations on what can be used efficiently and safely. Um, well, uh, at Ceresco, we believe in technology, of course. We, we know that it will be a great help for Binja. We, um, I suppose, that all of us have to. Add, add the farmer to this revolution. We need to to participate in in this changing in changing mindsets. It's a challenge for researchers, for educators, for technologists. We have to convince the the farmer that to get the best wine, he need the best grape, and technology can help help him to to do it. Um, thanks a lot uh, for your attention. Um, this is my contact. If you want more information or whatever, you can contact me. And um, well, and whatever you want. Thank you, Miguel. Uh, it was very interesting. So I don't know if there is some question. Maybe we have time to have one, two question in direct, and then people can ask by the chat. Uh, maybe uh, ah, I see that someone is asking next to me. Uh, I don't know. One. Uh, Carlos Lopez is asking which methodology are you using for early vineyard yield estimation? Uh, we are working with the Universidad de, de Navarra um, using different techniques uh, uh, based on the um, uh, phenological state. Is uh, a little bit well. I, I know a lot in in this matter, but uh, I can if, if someone want to send me an email, I can um, give them more information. Okay. A second question is from Zanzudai. Uh, nice talk. I would like to know when will a robot be affordable for a wine grower? Particularly for small wine growers. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a big question, um, and the, the thing is that we are thinking on offering services to um, to incorporate to the robots that um, you can uh, hire from. Um, from different um, firms that you can rent it or or just uh, contract um, contact the 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 developer to to rent it for only different um, 
uh, needs. Well, okay. I, I think I, I not explained it very very well. well. It's okay. You can exchange with Anzu yeah, if, yeah. You, if you want. And so, uh, if there is next question, maybe you can exchange directly on the chat. Uh, I see that there is another question now, but uh, so Miguel can exchange with you on the chat uh, to win a little bit of uh, time. Thank you, Miguel. Thank you very okay. much. Thanks a lot. Interesting te technology. So I should continue with uh, a presentation concerning, in fact, uh, uh, the disinfection. And uh, uh, I will talk a little bit about uh, disinfection and cleaning of the cellar. Um, so generally, we have uh, uh, this kind of trouble that has happening now. And uh, oh, my, uh, so you know all of you, of course, what is coronavirus, uh, family uh, affecting uh, respiratory tract, causing disease from common cold to pneumonia, uh, usually lives in bats and uh, other wild animals transmit to human directly or via other animals and between human via re respiratory droplets. And this is a key point here uh, that in fact need to be controlled. Uh, all of you know, the <clears throat> in fact, uh, the how it has worked. So from 31 of December until uh, March and, and from now, and it was some step. You remember that in fact, uh, WHO was alert by colleague in China. Uh, then uh, in fact, it was uh, developed. And uh, in fact, uh, the name uh, uh, of COVID-19 was given by uh, WHO. Um, so what is happening with this virus? Uh, in fact, uh, you have here a view uh, of the virus structural components and known modality of viral entry into the cells. Uh, you can see that there is a protein, hemagglutinin esterase dimer, tumeric spike in glycoprotein, uh, specific E protein, uh, RNA and nucleocapsid protein. So several components. And in fact, uh, the scheme also provides a summary panel of the potential health that can impact uh, human body, specific to lung, and in fact, the central nervous system. Um, so in fact, you have some specific enzyme, uh, angiotensin con converting enzyme 2, that can be affected. Uh, and it's because uh, this uh, type of enzyme is affected that the, the body answer uh, and conduct finally to the short or breath and breathing difficulties, acute uh, respiratory syndrome, and at the end, it, likes, it, it is like uh, if it was a, a pneumonia, but a strong one. So we know all of us the symptom fever, cough, uh, throat, fatigue, shortness of breath, sudden loss of smell and taste, head itches, muscle itches, diarrhea. And so uh, one unexpected impact, uh, in fact, for the wine sector is that many patients with COVID-19 experience a loss of taste, agosia, and or smell, anosmia. And so, of course, there will be some consequence for enologists, wine specialists for tasting, um, for this reason, for example, Enologist French Union uh, launched uh, an international survey on the loss of smell and taste for enologists and people of wine sector. And in fact, the loss of smell could be due to inflammation or nasal mucosa or more tagmated damage to the ol olfactory neuroepithelium. Uh, you can have also neurological damage via olfactory pathway. Um, and so, of course, uh, anosmia seems favorable in most cases within a few days to a few weeks. Uh, and some uh, study reports that smell recovery can uh, occur uh, within 15 days, but only in 44% of the case. And however, it could last up to be several months 
uh, as in other viral infection, and this needs to really more investigation. Um, in fact, since SARS-CoV-2 uh, is responsible for this uh, COVID-19 disease, um, of course, we have to adapt hygiene practice, and the virus is spread from person to person by this, prima, uh, this uh, primary, uh, uh, primarily respiratory uh, droplets uh, by an infected person. So the virus sh should go, in, in fact, onto surface, and it can survive there for variable duration, from a few hours to several days. For example, a study in New England Journal of Medicine uh, from Nils van Dormalen um, in 2020 reveals that the virus in particular is fond of stainless steel uh, and that it can remain uh, viable for two to three days. And during this period, transmission can be possible by contact with contaminated surfaces. The latest data from Chineal shows that SARS-CoV-2 is inactivated in uh, five minutes by heat at seven degrees. Celsius, ethanol, 70% volume, chloroxyphenol, 0.05% uh, of or chlorhexidine, 0.05%. Uh, it is resistant to pH between 3 and 10 and stable at 4 degrees for at least 14 days. So disinfectant used must be tested according to a standard that uh, is very important. It's EN. 4476 with a virucidal claim, in fact. Uh, how it works? In fact, you have here a, uh, a cut of the, of the virus uh, structure and uh, a 70 percent solution of ethyl alcohol, um, that is at 90 percent uh, volume, kill organisms by denaturing their protein and dissolving their lipid and it is effective against most bacteria, fungi, and many viruses, but is ineffective against bacterial spore, generally. So uh, the institute uh, that is a national institute in France uh, for the safety considers that coronavirus survive for a few hours on dry inert surface until six days, at least in humid environment. SARS-CoV-2 can uh, survive a few hours uh, to a few days at room temperature on different types of surfaces depending on the type of material. 24 hours on cardboard, two, three days on plastic or on stainless steel. The case of wood and glass was not reported un, uh, until now, but in a study by Kant Fehal, it is indicated that you can have four days of persistence for particular strain of coronavirus on this material. So on this condition, transmission by dirty hands, of course, to the face from a freshly contaminated surface seems possible. Alors, what are generally good cleaning and disinfection? Uh, so first of all, there is a few good cleaning and disinfection practice to remember. All the disinfectant you use must be testing according to the standard, EN 14476, with a virucidal claim. This is a, 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 a key issue. Uh, the dosing system of the product, as well as uh, uh, that of application, but must be reliable and in good condition. We should use personal protective equipment. Uh, it's essential before any cleaning or disinfection. A face mace, in this case at least a FFP2, as well as a pair of safety glasses, a pair of gloves, and a, pool, a full visor. Uh, the personal protective equipment must obviously uh, be in good condition and free from any deterioration or tearing. Glove uh, must be vinyl or chemical resistant. And uh, the personal protective e equipment must be clean and disinfect after use. How to dry clean surface? So one is to manually remove debris uh, if there is any and place it in a waste container. Then vacuum the area to avoid cross contamination. Cover all e electric uh, equipment around the area to be clean. Two, uh, or second, apply the disinfectant detergent adapted to the hardness of the water used on all surfaces. Three, leave in contact for five minutes. Then use a disposable cloth to clean the surface manually. And four, visually check that all surfaces are clean and repeat steps three and four if necessary. 
spray detergent uh, should uh, we should avoid in fact uh, chlorinated detergent in the cellar uh, but we can use spray detergent on all surfaces generally uh, beware of the least accessible area and interior surface which um, must not be for, forgotten and for electrical equipment it is better to spray the disinfectant on a cloth than wipe rather than spraying directly um, what are the priority, uh, the priority area targeted the contact point should also be clean and disinfected including switch touch screen door handles tank taps pump control, tank cover, tank doors, gateway, valves, uh, technical device that regulate the flow of a liquid, uh, wine dishes, uh, pipes and under use, uh, uh, notably. Uh, point four, what procedure should be implemented in, uh, uh, in a case of coronavirus declared or suspected in the work environment? Uh, in the event that one of the people working in the winery turned out to be con contaminated, or even if uh, simply suspected, a nebulization of the production area is necessary to ensure that all surfaces, including the equipment for processing the air, are properly disinfected. So to do this, it's necessary to assess the risk, check the compatibility of the disinfectant with the cellar material, spray the cellar with a virucidal disinfectant, and so, of course, the total quarantine is essential during the nebulization period. And then after that, a ventilation of the cellar after nebulization. Point five, uh, which detergent uh, we should use? So you have a list of disinfectants to be used in the fight against SARS-CoV-2 that is available uh, at the address you can see here by the EPI in the United States. Uh, you have a list uh, and disinfectant use against SARS-CoV-2. Uh, you can see, for example, that uh, cleaning chemicals such as caustic soda traditionally uh, used in the wine industry have not been shown to be particularly effective against SARS-CoV. Uh, coronavirus responsible uh, for SARS in 2003. So um, it's maybe not the best way to, to, uh, to clean. Um, chlorine based bleaching solutions are commonly mentioned by the World Health Organization, uh, the DOH and the CDC in Australia, but also in New Zealand, for example, or in the United States. However, this chlorine based disinfectant and bleaches are maybe not recommended in a winery because of their potential to generate chlorophenol and possible chloroanisole. Um, then there is ethanol solution, generally 70% uh, in water, that are effective against coronaviruses and therefore recommended for commonly uh, affected cellar surfaces. It is recommended that you wait at least 30 to 60 seconds before wiping off the spray ethanol solution so that the contact time is sufficient uh, to inactivate the, uh, the virus. You can use also disinfectant based on quaternary ammonium. Uh, this is also possible. And uh, you can have also solution of soapy water or 7% ethanol solution uh, to disinfect the office and equipment, for example. So generally, what we know uh, because of the test is that ethyl alcohol at concentration of six, between 60 and 80% is really a potent virucidal agent inactivating um, all the lipophilic viruses it can be, for example, herpes, vaccinia, influenza uh, virus, but also hydrophilic, hydrophilic vir viruses like adenovirus, enterovirus, rhinovirus, or rotaviruses, but not hepatitis A, uh, for example, virus or polyvirus. So here you have the, the reference uh, that I've been using uh, to present you this, uh, this slide. Uh, and so if you want to have uh, all the information I have been uh, uh, telling you, you can get it in the Revue Française d'Energie, the French Energy uh, Review uh, journal. Uh, you have here the reference of the author uh, concerning disinfection and cleaning of cellar water the practice during the COVID-19 time. This paper is in French and in English. And so you can uh, get it easily or if you want if you cannot get it, you ask me and we can send you.
And so I think that uh, I want to thank all of you, of course, for the uh, for the talk. I see that there is a question. It was more question on the talk of uh, Miguel. I don't know if there is question. Uh, alors, this is a question from uh, Andrei Tarasov. Thank you for the interesting talk. Are there recommendations for the cleaning of glasses for wine testing? So uh, the, the point is that uh, it's possible to clean, of course. Normally with soap, uh, it should be uh, easy. Soap and uh, water, uh, hot water should be, should be okay. You can clean, of course, uh, with uh, ethanol solution, uh, but also with vapor. Uh, so there is several ways to clean the water, so the glasses, uh, generally. Uh, but normally, soap, alcohol, solution, uh, vapor and heat generally are okay until uh, 70 degrees, 60 degrees. Uh, so I don't know if there is other question. It looks unknown. Okay, so in this case, we can, ah, maybe one other. Is there some prevention measure put in cellar to avoid COVID-19 appearance? Uh, it's, uh, it's not so easy. The point is that uh, some people are talking about the possibility to have the contamination by air. Uh, and so in this case, it's probably necessary to clean the air. Um, so I think that in function of the type of the winery, you, you, are, you can have adapted uh, methodology or procedure. One point is to do ventilation, probably. Uh, the fact to do ventilation, it's probably a good way, in fact, to, to try to uh, uh, avoid, in fact, uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, entrance. Okay, so then we can probably move on to the next speaker. And the uh, next speaker, alors, I have probably to do something. Uh, voilà. So uh, next speaker is now uh, Liliana, uh, Professor Liliana Martinez from the University of Cuyo. Uh, with challenge in uh, harvest and wine tourism in Argentina during COVID-19. Uh, tourism has been uh, uh, strongly affected by this pandemic. And so uh, we are happy to have your view, Liliana, and thank you to be with us. We cannot speak, you, you, we cannot hear you. Liliana, we cannot hear you. Liliana? Could you, could uh, you yeah. hear me? Yes. Now, yes, thank you. Okay, thank and you. could you see the screen? It's okay. Okay, well. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to give uh, this presentation. I am really happy to stay here from Mendoza and share with you the challenges in harvest and wine tourism in Argentina during COVID-19. According to the OIB reports, uh, the total amount of surface area covered uh, with vineyard uh, was estimated in 7.4 million hectares. Um, seven countries accounted for 60% uh, of the total surface area. And Argentina uh, is placed into the seventh place just after Spain, China, France, Italy, Turkey, and USA. In the next figure, we can see the evolution of the global surface area covered with vineyard from 2000 and 2019. 
uh, in this figure, we can see a slight increase, uh, then uh, a downward trend, after that a rise, and uh, after all, an overall stability during the last three years. In Argentina, uh, the, um, the evolution of surface area, uh, which is presented in this uh, figure, can show that uh, during uh, 2019, the total area was about uh, 215,000 hectares, uh, showing uh, an important decrease uh, comparing to the uh, previous year. In the next figure, we can see, uh, <clears throat> I can, I can, uh, uh, yes, we can see the evolution of the grape production area, which shows uh, an, uh, a total value of two million uh, of uh, two billion of kilograms during uh, 2020. Uh, this uh, shows an important um, uh, decrease uh, comparing to uh, 2019. And uh, uh, this uh, drop in yield was uh, mainly due to uh, weather condition. Uh, in Mendoza, uh, during uh, uh, spring, there were frosts uh, that uh, caused uh, a decrease in fruit sets. Also, there were uh, 60 days, I don't know what happened with my presentation, 60 days with temperatures over 32 degrees, uh, lesser uh, thermal amplitude, and uh, many uh, vineyards suffer from drought. All these uh, variables together uh, provoke a, a decrease in the total uh, grape harvested. And also there was registered an early and concentrated uh, harvest. This is the timeline of the harvest in Argentina during 2020. The vintage started in February and when we, are in the, when we were in the day number 18, the first COVID uh, Argentinian case appeared. Uh, this was in March the 3rd. After that, um, the uh, Wealth uh, uh, Health Organization stated the world situation as a pandemic. Uh, fortunately, a group of uh, different actors of the wine industry was working, uh, trying to discuss how to uh, face the pandemic. And uh, another group of uh, technical uh, persons uh, composed by private and uh, public sectors uh, prepare a protocol uh, in the middle of the uh, March. Uh, so as soon as the national um, government declared the quarantine, um, the industry sent the protocol to the uh, national uh, government and as to be excluded uh, as, uh, from the protocol, from the quarantine, and to be uh, included as essential activity. Successfully, uh, the national government accepted, and then we, can, uh, we could uh, continue with the harvest and finish it normally. Of course, under a strict protocol, uh, which was applied to every person that uh, was working for the viticultural activities. And that uh, consists on keeping social distances, distancing at least two meters, uh, frequent hand, uh, hand washing with soap or, or, and water, or alcohol 70 uh, degrees, mandatory use of face masks, uh, transport restriction, especially uh, for workers uh, um, in vineyards, and also uh, for uh, grapes uh, when they were uh, delivered from the vineyard to a uh, winery. Uh, there was a special coordination in order not to be, um, uh, not to be uh, many people in the, in the winery uh, waiting. Uh, another point was a permanent information to the old chain uh, industry act, um, uh, actors were, were uh, given and uh, all these people receive the financial support from the government to afford the labor cost during harvest. The most important thing was a zero COVID-19 uh, cases were detected during and until the harvest was finished, nor even uh, was registered a delay or a decline in the total amount of the harvest. Uh, and this was due to uh, a strict compliance was followed. 
of the protocol. In this, um, in this uh, slide, we can see uh, the, uh, an, estimated, an early estimation of the average uh, total uh, harvested, which was about 26.7 billion liters. Uh, in general terms, uh, it's predicted a, a down a, a drop in the total harvest. And in the southern uh, hemisphere, there is, um, <clears throat> there is a, a, it's expected uh, to be a, a low, uh, to be a lower uh, yield uh, for the majority of the country. As I mentioned before, Argentina has a, a lower uh, harvest, uh, as well as Chile and, uh, or as well as Chile and Brazil, and with the exception of South Africa and uh, Uruguay. Uh, of course, this data uh, has to be uh, considered carefully since uh, we are in the an, in an exceptional uh, circumstances right now. Uh, according to the wine trade, uh, the domestic uh, market of the Argentina has been expanded and nowadays, or in 2019, uh, it's about 7-4% uh, compared to 26% uh, of the export market. Uh, wine is a commodity very important for Argentina. And Argentina occupies the 10th place uh, in terms of wine producing uh, at worldwide level. Well, uh, this figure shows the evolution of the uh, total volume and volume of um, Argentine wine uh, from 2009 to, two, uh, to 2019. Uh, and this is the value, the total value in $4 million in the first uh, year. Uh, both variable uh, experiences and increase, and after that, uh, the, um, the value and, uh, remain the same. Meanwhile, the uh, volume uh, fluctuates a little bit up and up and down. In, 19, uh, uh, in 2019, uh, there were uh, 130 markets where uh, all the Argentinian uh, uh, wines were exported, a total uh, amount of $814.5 million, which represents a decrease uh, compared to the previous year of 2.7%. The same trend was uh, uh, followed by the average value of the liter, uh, which was uh, $2.5, uh, and uh, also registered an, in, a decrease uh, in, the, in the contrast, the, the total volume was uh, higher and uh, it showed an increase of uh, 13%. Uh, in this list, we can see the value of export to the top 10 markets uh, in which appear a list of, uh, of uh, United States of America, United Kingdom, Canada, Brazil, Netherlands, China, Mexico, Germany, France, and Paraguay. Uh, United States uh, ranks for the first place, uh, meanwhile, uh, United Kingdom the second. Uh, in spite of uh, being the first uh, market where our wines goes, uh, in United States uh, it was registered a little contraction of 7.7%. Uh, uh, in the other list, uh, there appear, uh, appear the volume of export to the top te uh, te uh, 10 markets in millions of liters, and uh, the first eight uh, countries um, show an increase. And uh, an issue to point out was uh, China appear as an important uh, consumer of wine uh, uh, from Argentina. In this figure, uh, we can see the export uh, from 27 to 2020. Uh, and in terms of volume, it was a, a very important increase during uh, the, the um, excuse me, during the, uh, uh, the month from January to April. Uh, in terms of uh, value, uh, all the years uh, behave the same without uh, any variations. Well, this is the result of the Argentinian survey uh, uh, done uh, during the, um, the quarantine. And uh, in this uh, graphic, we can see that uh, the consumption of different items was different. For example, the house and cleaning, the dry food uh, product, as well as hygiene and cosmetics, the dairy product and breakfast and snakes, 
uh, suffer an increase uh, also with a drink without, uh, without alcohol. Nevertheless, uh, or on the contrary, drinks with alcohol show a, a decrease uh, as well as uh, candies. And if we look deeper, um, beer decreased uh, in 2.8%, meanwhile wines in 4.7%. Uh, the wine consumption per capita in Argentina uh, show this, uh, this figure. Uh, which is very unpleasant for the Argentinian people because uh, during the uh, 70s uh, we used to drink more than 90, 19 liters. Nowadays we are uh, drinking only 19 liters. So uh, this uh, spectacular uh, decrease um, was about 80%. Although uh, wine is a, is a part of uh, Argentinian uh, culture uh, because it uh, means gathering people or uh, friends or family uh, around the, the, the dinner table, also, um, nevertheless, uh, it was registered uh, an important decrease. And what happened uh, in, in terms of home and non-home consumption? Approximately in Argentina, 70% of the wine is consumed at home and uh, the rest, 30% uh, is consumed outside home. Uh, for example, in restaurants, hotels, bars, cafeterias. And um, an early estimation presume that wine consumption uh, in all over the world will be uh, suffer uh, from a decrease if we compare, for example, in the case of Argentina, uh, March uh, 2020 versus the previous uh, year on the same uh, month. And uh, we, uh, we um, expect a decrease of 30%, which is uh, composed by 5% of the off-trade uh, market and 100% uh, of on-trade market. Well, since uh, 1987, uh, Mendoza, which is a province of Argentina, uh, was uh, declared as, uh, um, as part of the uh, great uh, global capital. Since then, our, um, our wine tourism has been uh, increasing a lot and nowadays uh, keeps on uh, evolving. Uh, well, the wine tourism offer, of course, a different uh, kind of activity, the, the classical one, uh, which uh, consisted on uh, visiting uh, wineries uh, and also cup tastings, uh, but also um, there are um, many other activities I will explain later. This is a map where we can, uh, we can see different uh, regions uh, devoted to wine tourism uh, in Argentina. The orange one um, belongs to the, uh, to the regions called Central West, which is composed uh, by Mendoza, San Juan, Neuquén. And uh, all of them have a total of 165 wineries open to wine tourism. Uh, that accounts for uh, a total of 72%. Meanwhile, the other regions, the, the green one and the Northwest regions accounted for a, a total of 19% of uh, wineries open to, uh, to wine tourism and the uh, new regions uh, appear uh, as uh, uh, accounting for only 8%. Well, um, as I tell you, as I told you before, uh, Mendoza and the other regions offer uh, gastronomy, also offer live uh, classical music through the rows of the uh, of the wines uh, in different uh, wineries. Offer also to pick, for example, the harvest, or uh, this is a very fun uh, activity, uh, is uh, the rally in the wineries, uh, which is a kind of a sort of uh, regularity races of all cards. And also offer uh, another activities like yoga in wineries and rides uh, through vineyards or have uh, horseback ridings. And why not? Uh, to, to spend a night in a, in a luxurious hotel in a room that is uh, located over the vineyards, looking the fantastic uh, view of the mountains, 
or visit the, the classical colonial wineries uh, located in Salta, in the north of Argentina. What happened with the, when the coronavirus uh, arrived to Argentina in terms of wine tourism? At first, it was a completed lockdown in Argentina that causes a complete paralysis because all the flights, uh, all the air flights were cancelled, the hotels were closed, and all the events were suspended. But uh, due to a certain province like uh, Mendoza, Salta, San Juan, has a, a little spread of the virus, uh, in June the, the 7th, uh, it was allowed a local tourism. Of course, keeping social distancing, uh, having uh, frequent hand washings, and uh, this is important issues that consist in occupying no more than 50% of the total area uh, in restaurants, hotels, and wineries. And tastes in winery uh, using face masks and only one glass per, pe per person. What next? Well, in, uh, in terms of uh, COVID-19, uh, I think that all the humankind is expecting the vaccines, but uh, related to wine, in order to increase the consumption and the sales is uh, needed to, to think about a bunch of uh, strategic, strategic measures uh, which uh, can consist, for example, in innovation. Innovation in, in where? Well, for example, innovation in packaging, uh, offering to different packaging uh, to people who prefer to stay at home, or maybe uh, cans for, for parties, or maybe bag in box for hotels and restaurants. Or why not a, a plastic a glass a, to, to bring a, or to use in during parties, a, especially for young people. Or a, nowadays there is a strong trend a, using a virtual a reality, for example, doing a winery tours a, using virtual reality or doing a wine tasting. And of course, it's very important to transform the uh, sophisticated and uh, image of the wine into a more rebellious or more trans transgressor in order to engage peop uh, young people to drink wines. And also we, had, uh, we have to, to dip uh, more inside uh, social media networks and of course uh, develop a more um, platform, um, electronic platform, because uh, one a survey has uh, registered it that during um, the quarantine, many people uh, have been uh, shifting uh, and purchase the wines uh, online. Well, thank you very much for your attention. It, that's all. <laughs> Thank you, Liliana. It was interesting. You had a question. Uh, first question from Marianne Mackey is any idea why wine consumption has decreased by such a large percentage in Argentina? Yeah, it's because, uh, well, uh, people is changing uh, to or is moving uh, towards uh, another drinks, uh, especially beers. And uh, well, the um, and people used to to drink uh, wine uh, when uh, they are at home, but nowadays the the modern lines um, avoid people uh, staying at home. For example, during lunch. So uh, this this is another reason why the consumption has decreased. Okay, uh, another one. Uh, I see. Well, a spectator, but it's the same one. Uh, another one from Cynthia Kolibaba. How do you do wine testing with face mask? Well, uh, of course, you have to 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 have the face mask, uh, the face mask, uh, until you do to drink the the wine. Uh, you you have to pull uh, pull uh, pull apart and then drink and then uh, use to uh, again. Okay. Uh, another one, do you know how winery are sorting now to manage wine tourism? Since in Mendoza, for example, wine tourism has been always mostly foreign. For, for what? Foreign, like foreigner. Ah, yes. Uh, yeah, no, no, mostly. Uh, I think uh, it's 30% uh, of the visitor comes from uh, abroad. 
but 70% of the visitor uh, is from Argentina. And well, nowadays, uh, local um, uh, tourism are allowed. That means that, uh, for example, people from Mendoza can visit wineries uh, from Mendoza, not from uh, other uh, part of the Argentina. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Liliana. So we can stop the question for now. If someone has something to ask you, we can ask you by the chat or by mail. Uh, thanks again for your expertise. So next speaker is Professor and our friend Vittorino Novello from University of Torino. Who will uh, he will speak about how to overcome the pandemic effect in viticulture. So my dear friend Vittorino is to you. Okay. Thank you, Pierre Louis. Uh, I can uh, I can start my presentation. That is how to overcome the pandemic effects in vitiviniculture. So not only viticulture, but all all the uh, uh, viti and wine. So uh, we know that uh, the first case started of uh, of pandemic started on December 1st on uh, 20, 2019 in China and then all the world of humanity has been swept away by the wave of the CODIP. Of, of course with many effects on the health and economic consequences. One of the uh, biggest problem was the uh, the closure of the school. The closure of the school because, uh, uh, of course, there was uh, the, the risk for the uh, increase of the epidemic in the, in, the, in, the, in the school with the contact of the, um, of the, the student. So we, see, we have uh, in April more or less one and a half billion of students uh, were affected by this and uh, they were uh, with the the, uh, the school closed, the school closure. Well, just to synthesize, what are the main effects on vitivinicultura? Well, one of the first is uh, the not the less availability of uh, the seasonal manpower due to the closure of the borders for the foreign uh, manpowers, foreign labors, and also the schools because many. Uh, many people has to, to, to stay at home to take care of the children because the schools were closed. And this was uh, one of the main problems of the 2020 harvesting, uh, grape harvesting in the South Hemisphere, uh, like uh, Australia, uh, New Zealand, uh, Argentina, South Africa, and so on. They were able to finish the harvesting using the local main power because of uh, the lack of the uh, foreign uh, people. And also, uh, there was uh, the, uh, the starting of the protocol for health and safety that can limit the activity and they, uh, of course, they can, it can increase the costs of production for all the uh, vineyard and winery. So at the end, uh, uh, there was there has been uh, very big uh, financial difficulties, either for the growers and for the wineries. That means less salary for the people. In some many cases, loss of jobs. So at the end, there was less family budget to buy wine and also other goods. And uh, going to the uh, wine consumption, that is being. Uh, less consumption because of the closing of specialized wine stories, restaurants, wineries, also the direct sales, the wall sales, and this reduction of wine consumption has increased the wine stocks in the winery. In parallel, there's been an increase of food retail because, uh, of course, uh, we had to eat to survive, and especially on the local uh, food, on local uh, uh, 
products because we will see there's been difficulties for transportation also. So there has been a kind of improvement of the local, like fruit, like uh, or any kind of food. And also some increase also on uh, wine, uh, increase of uh, by uh, some wines, by the online retail. And this, in many cases, has uh, overcome a little bit the reduction of uh, wine consumers due to the uh, closure of these uh, stores. Of course, the, uh, as we have seen, as Liliana also showed very well, it was the uh, introduction of the uh, safeguard uh, worker health and safety, like the suspension of the activities, not essential. It was not the case of uh, viticulture, but uh, for many other uh, cases. Uh, the, uh, uh, the resort of the smart working methods, that is the activities that can be carried out at home, it has been increased a lot all around the world. The use of individual protection equipment at the interpersonal distance of one meter, the intensification of workplace sanitization, as uh, Luis uh, very well explained before, the limitation of movements within sites and the access to common areas. This uh, was due, of course, to uh, the, the, the quarantine, and the, the blocks of many places, and also some, some transportation problems and limitation in crisis due to the uh, closing borders, lack of drivers, lack of container, the space in uh, boats, uh, cancel of flights, and so on. And the closing of hotel, restaurant, bar, bed and breakfast, and agritourism dramatically reduced the tourism and particularly the enotourism. So just some, uh, some numbers, uh, of course, that I found in the, in the OIV press, maybe they are not correct, but just to have an idea what happened about the wine consumption and market. Uh, for example, in Italy, uh, the uh, export uh, of the wine in Germany dropped by 8.9% and the UK by 13.3%. And the price of the wine dropped by 7% in Germany and by 18% in UK. And uh, about this uh, drop of, of the price, the sparkling wines and the premium wines have uh, suffered more than the normal, let's say, quality wines. In France, uh, there's been a half of a sales. They are thinking a loss of 1.7 billion euro. And uh, there was a minus 30% of ex export of uh, uh, foreign wines. In Spain, the reduction was about 24% in March, 31% in April, with it, the internal market dropped uh, for 75% uh, and the export 45%. And the export was minus 16% of bulk wine. You know, Spain is a very big uh, country for bulk wine export. The bottles minus 7% and the cava 4.7%. And all this problem interested 90% of the winery, of which 44, uh, 54 was small wineries. In California, there's been uh, a minus uh, uh, 40, uh, 437 million of dollars of sales, and they are thinking a loss of no 9.1 million cases from March 2020 until the next February 2021. And they are thinking about the loss of 42,000 jobs, that is a lot. In Australia, there's been uh, people 
that the consume less wine was about 82, 85 percent, but there was more, some 15, 18 percent that uh, drink more wine during the lockdown. Uh, I found that in Argentina the consumption was uh, increased by 2 percent from January to May. This is a little bit different from what uh, Liliana said. And there was uh, an increase of market of 3.5, but uh, in this average, we have a, a minus 2.7 of the whites wine, less, and also the sparkling wine. Sparkling wine has a, a, a drop of about 59, 59%. As I said before, uh, the uh, sparkling wine has more, suffered more, probably because the price, of course, and because the people has less salary worldwide. And uh, so globally, there was a, a, a drop of the world market for 10.7% and uh, a world wine consumption drop by 14%, around 40%. And you know, sparkling, as said before, was less than 15%. There was a, also a, a kind of, not strange, but a, a kind of phenomenon that was the consumption alternatives. Let's say in begging box, it was increased 43% in France, 37 in Norway, Norway, 13 in Finland, uh, 12 in Sweden, and 17% in Canada. So in the northern part of the, of the globe, they drink more wine in the begging box because of uh, it's easy, it's in a, an easy, uh, way to uh, buy the wine and to preserve the wine in the refrigerator and so on and so on. And also there's been an increase in uh, Canada wines. They say that in California increased by 200 percent the production of uh, uh, and consume of uh, Canada wines. And uh, the lockdown, the, the uh, pandemic, of course, affected also table grapes and raisins. Uh, as an example, Argentina export 33% less of uh, uh, raisins. And uh, this 33% in volume is due to minus 30% of production, but minus 70% of the COVID-19 because uh, one of the biggest uh, uh, countries that uh, buy the uh, Argentinian raisins was Brazil. And Brazil, of course, has a big problem with the, uh, the virus. And also India has a, a reduction of export of table grapes by 24% in the Maharashtra state, that is uh, the state that give the 80% of the national production. Okay, what are the remedies of this pandemic in the short term? Well, for sure, some public contribution and easy loans to growers and winemakers is very important, of course, to cover the uh, financial difficulties. To establish a preferential corridor for labor, especially for the foreign people that can come back to, uh, uh, to work in the, wine, in the vineyard first and the less in the, in the winery. Many of these foreign people went uh, home for the Christmas time and they were not able to come back to work for the uh, lockdown. Another point is uh, the reduction of the yield, of the great yield. And this, of course, because uh, we have uh, a lot of stocks, wine stocks, so we need uh, to empty the, the tanks for the next uh, vintage. So let's say some example. In Spain, uh, they are uh, thinking to reduce in uh, this year the yield from 12 tons to 10 tons per hectare. In France, in Bordeaux, they are thinking to reduce the surface by 10,000 hectares. In Champagne, 
they are thinking to reduce the yield to nine tons and block the production until 22, just to avoid the decrease of the price and of course to uh, reduce the stocks. In Italy, uh, there's been a contribution for the green harvest. And uh, these are some uh, value like uh, 400 euros per hectare for the IGT, uh, for the DOC 600 and seven or 700 uh, euro per hectare, uh, depending on the maximum of the total uh, production, total yield, and for the uh, denomination uh, controlled and guarantee uh, can uh, reach 800, 900 euro per hectare. For the Prosecco, the consortium has uh, proposed a three year block of new plantations to reduce the yield, the total yields. For the Brunello Montalcino, the yield uh, was reduced from eight to seven tons per hectare. In the Piemont, uh, they are thinking to increase 10% of the harvest reserve. About the wine stocks, uh, also Prosecco is uh, thinking to storage all the production of 2019. Another solution is to convert the wine to hand sanitizer. That is one of the process that could be done with the wine to increase the vintage blend from 15 to 20, 30 percent, to enlarging the area of aging outside the denomination. And this is uh, one request that uh, uh, the Piedmont region uh, is uh, asking to the ministry for the lung wines in the Piedmont in order to empty the casks and to uh, fill the cask with the new uh, uh, vintage, the new 2020 uh, year vintage, and the wine distillation, wine distillation with public contribution. Uh, for example, in uh, in Italy, the the government had put 50 is spending 50 millions of euros for this kind of, of distillation, with the price of 2.75 euros per volume per hectoliter. Uh, while in Spain, for the distillation is paid 0.035 uh, uh, euros, and in France, 0.58 euros. So these are some short terms, immediate terms, immediate uh, works to reduce, of course, the uh, excess of uh, stocks. What about long terms? In long term. Uh, just some suggestions as already done by, uh, uh, by Liliana, but for sure to increase the permanent labor contracts and uh, in this way to re reduce the needs of seasonal labor is very important to avoid the, the problem that we had now for the uh, manpower. And also to reduce manpower, the vineyard mechanization, uh, but vineyard mechanization we have to pay attention sometimes to the social and environmental aspect of the mechanization. Uh, and uh, another point will be the vineyard and wine di digitalization. So the increase of the precision viticulture. And we had, uh, had a very good uh, uh, example by Miguel. And also the smart working that can uh, that is increasing, of course, uh, in this in this pandemic time, and uh, the increase of uh, e-commerce, especially in Italy, the e-commerce in the wine sector was not so expanded, but now is becoming very very important. To resume fairs and the wine festival, of course, that was uh, that were blocked by the pandemic, is very important to increase the knowledge of the wine. Uh, the different wines to stimulate also the client fidelization. Client fidelization is very important because people has to come back, uh, have to come back to the same winery to buy the same wine. And uh, there is a 
very good example of a fidelization in California and probably uh, it's important to uh, to copy this uh, technique <laughs> let's say it's a kind of technique and of course to stimulate agritourism agri -tourism and enotourism that probably is uh, one of the best way to uh, increase the wine consumer thank you so much okay Vittorino, you, you, you are finished? Yes, I finished. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Torino, for this uh, very interesting way to manage the production in terms of viticulture. Um, I look if there is a question. Uh, so it looks that there is one. Uh, Juan Miguel Canals is uh, from Tarragona. He's saying that in Catalonia, Area Cava, they are studying grape juice concentration and rectification. Uh, in fact, uh, with public contribution in order to retire from the market part of the grapes to produce wine. Do you know any similar experience? No, I don't know. I don't know if there are some, some uh, but the, the concept is the same for the, uh, for the Prosecco. The Prosecco, they, they stop, uh, they block the fermentation, they preserve the must, and then they, uh, uh, when, when it's time, of course, they finish the production of Prosecco. I think it's the same as in Catalonia, the same process. Okay. When I said that they block the, pro the production of 2019, of course, this is the way. Okay. Okay, it looks maybe that there is uh, another question and then we will move on. Uh, next one. Ah, he says that uh, they use the RCM for the second alcoholic fermentation, in fact. Okay. Yes, for course. Yeah. So there are two, two ways. One is to uh, uh, unfermented the, the must and then to produce the sparkling wine at the end, uh, like a Prosecco system, or to use uh, the uh, rectified must, yeah. concentrate must, of course, for the increase the alcohol concentration in some cases. Now it's not, uh, it's not uh, always uh, uh, the problem because of uh, climate change, we have been increasing in the alcohol production. Yes. Yes. Times we have to reduce the alcohol instead to increase, but it could be done. Uh, also for other things like juice, like production of uh, grape juice or something like that. Okay, thank you Vittorino. Uh, we should move on with next speaker. Next speaker is uh, Professor Zanzudai from the Chinese Academy of Science in Beijing, in China. And uh, he's talking about how to choose suitable grape cultivar for a new terroir, digging all data, for a new boost. So Zanzu, it's to you. Okay. Can you hear me, uh, Pierre? Yes, it's perfect. Okay, so I will, I will adjust this. So I guess it's okay. So hi, uh, everyone. I, first, of, first of all, I, I would like to thank the organization uh, committee uh, for the invitation to uh, make this presentation. And uh, after listening uh, for the presentation from the previous speakers, I, I think it's really uh, interesting for these uh, all different kinds of uh, uh, aspects that we can do to help the industry during this re Uh, work uh, to help the industry. So I would like to first uh, start uh, okay. So with this map showing the wine uh, pr producing region in China. In fact, what I want to highlight is uh, most of the wine uh, production in China uh, are located in north part of the China. 
and uh, it has a we yes. cannot see the map in fact oh uh the slide no is, is it better no i have we have the first one okay It's probably there's some uh, connect connection problem. I will try now. Can you see it? No, we we uh, well, no. We can see only okay. the first slide. In fact, probably I will I will yeah. stop the the sharing and then restart it again. Sorry for. Uh, the... Okay, I will restart. Okay, let's see. Can you, can you see it now? Oh. Uh, no? Let's see. He says that you have to click two times to be in uh, full screen. No? No, wait, uh, I have something black. I don't know. Can you see it? Uh, no, I'm sorry oh. about that. Uh, oh. <laughs> Probably I will keep it uh, not in full screen. Can you see it like this? No. No. Myself, no. Uh, sure. <sighs> well, it's the choice of the direct. <laughs> this? Uh, no, we don't see. Oh. <laughs> it says that you have to click two times. Uh, uh, but I don't know. I clicked. Normally, should be okay. Like this. Right. Um. Oh, let's see. Try, try now, maybe. Okay. Okay. I'll well, try. So I think you forbidden me to share the screen. No, no. Normally, you can. Ah, uh, now it's okay. I don't Hello? know. Thanks. No. Zanzu, uh, Agat is saying that uh, it shows that your internet signal is very, very low. Ah. And that is probably the reason. Oh, I will check. Um, but it works last time. It's the same connection. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what 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 can we do. Uh, I'll check. This should be okay. I will probably uh, maybe cut maybe my, what I will cut my if it's I will cut, yes I will cut my video and then try try it again. Maybe Zanzu, what we can uh -huh. do. Uh, yes. is to ask maybe Andy Waterhouse to, to, to give the talk now. Yes. Uh, and then uh, uh, you can talk after, after Andy maybe. And uh, like yes. that, yes. you have time maybe to send us your slide. And okay. then okay. Uh, we can try to share uh, when, you, when you talk. Yes, I will do this. Okay. Okay. Sorry for this. <laughs> no, it's okay. No, no, no trouble. We can understand. <laughs> Don't worry. So in this case, uh, so hello Andy. I I know that it's uh, very early in California, and sorry that <laughs> you have to to wake up very early. So and thank you for to be there. So maybe you can uh, tell us uh, how California are responding to uh, COVID nineteen, uh, and so you you have the floor now. Thank you, Andy. Hey, good morning. Uh, okay. Um, well, thank you for the chance to speak here, Pierre Louis. Um, I uh, <clears throat> I think you'll be hearing some similar stories to what you've heard already from some of the other speakers. Um, I was going to cover what's happening 
at UC Davis in our research program, teaching program, which is uh, new for us, of course, for everyone, but it's the same. Uh, and also discuss some of the effects on the grape and wine industry here in California. Um, so as everywhere, uh, large groups are banned for any purpose, really. Um, but in academia, what this means is we cannot have our normal lectures. So um, starting in April, uh, all of our lectures uh, went online. So um, for me, it wasn't so difficult because I didn't have a normal class at that time. I had a guest lecture. So we had our guests come online and it all it worked pretty smoothly. Um, one of the things we noticed is that this had a large effect on the students. Um, the students could not socialize in a normal manner. So uh, they were, they found it very difficult. Um, we adjusted the classes so the students could talk uh, before class or after class using Zoom. And they liked that. It was helped them a little bit. Um, when we look forward to next, to the, the fall quarter, uh, we're gonna start in September. Um, we've made the decision now that everything will be online. And in fact, we expect that many students will not come to Davis. Um, they will not, they will, they will cancel their registration. Um, we don't know what the numbers are like. Uh, <clears throat> we're gonna try to find out in advance. But um, some students have already told us if the teaching is online, that they will not, they will not attend. They will wait until next year. And for each, for the students, it's not such a big problem, but for the university, it's a very big problem because if we don't have enough students, then we don't have enough money because the students here, they pay for their registration. <clears throat> so there's a concern that the budget of the university will be impacted. And we don't know exactly how this is gonna work. Um, already we know that the, the, the state of California is gonna pay the university about 10% less um, than last year. <clears throat> but if we have many fewer students, then our, means our budget is even smaller. So. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty right now what's going to happen uh, with the fall instruction. Um, <clears throat> we just sent an announcement yesterday to all the students that uh, everything will be online for the fall. So we'll see, we'll see what happens. Um, one thing I am involved with right now is preparing to teach laboratory instruction, uh, which is and normally our practical instruction. <clears throat> We've made a big effort in, to have lots of practical instruction here at UC Davis for our students uh, in enology. <clears throat> but this year we're gonna be teaching laboratory uh, by video demonstrations, which I think is, it's okay, but it's not the same. And in fact, we have to make many other adjustments to how we're teaching, what we're teaching. So <clears throat> it's, a big, it's a big difference uh, this year. Of course, um, all other meetings are held online. So we uh, have many uh, outreach uh, programs for the industry. And uh, we're hoping <laughs> that by December we'll have in-person meetings, but right now everything is virtual. So we're holding meetings just like this for the industry to give them updates on new research and planning for harvest and so on. And all this is using Zoom and other te technologies. One thing we did uh, at the end of the year in, um, in, here in June, we always have at the end of the year a ceremony to 
celebrate the, end, the graduation of students who are finishing their degrees. And those were basically all canceled. Um, we had a small program for our students in enology and viticulture. And uh, we had about 100 people attend uh, online. And we read the names of all the students and we announced uh, the special awards and things like that. And the students liked that. Um, but of course, they weren't able to have a party with their friends <clears throat> as they would normally do. So that also was a, a bit of a letdown for the students. And then I just to mention this, I'm sure everyone is doing the same thing, but even to have a meeting with one person, we do this <laughs> using Zoom, which is strange or anyway. So <clears throat> our life has become virtual. So however, with research, we actually have to go to the laboratory to do the research. Um, and right now we're, we're phasing in activity so uh, at the beginning, we're, the projects were limited to COVID-related research. And then uh, we were allowed to do research related to plants and animals. So that work pretty much didn't stop. Um, uh, people are working in the vineyard and our, our wine production is considered essential. So. Uh, we've always had somebody working in the winery, although many fewer people. Um, <clears throat> uh, we, are, we do have normal activity in the vineyard, except that the workers have to stay far apart. Um, and <clears throat> in, in the research projects, um, we've allowed students who are completing their degrees to come to finish their research. So one of the criteria for continuing your work is that you have to finish your degree. So I have a couple of students now working in projects. The, and the reason is that uh, they're supposed to complete their degree in, in uh, the summer. So they're allowed to do the work in, in, in the laboratory. However, uh, we cannot have too many people in the laboratory at the same time. So I have a lab with nine, uh, 90 meters. Um, normally I have about six people in there, but right now I limit the, the worker population in the laboratory to two. So some people are working at night, some people are working during the day, um, and we want to avoid having many people in the lab at the same time. Uh, <clears throat> this also means that uh, if someone wants to do analysis that uh, they have to wait in line. So in the laboratory with all the analytical equipment, which is <laughs> now we're wondering, we have to move the equipment maybe. Um, we can only have three people in the lab at the same time. So instead of six people or nine people, whatever we used to have, now we have to have many fewer people. So that means access to the LCMS, so the GCMS is limited. So everything is slowing down. Uh, and then we have to have records for who was present in the lab each day during, uh, at any time. So if we find one person is positive for COVID-19, then we have to contact all the people who we're in the lab at the same time. So we have to have records of attendance for all the laboratories, uh, for, the, <clears throat> for the winery, so that if anyone gets ill, that we can uh, quarantine people who are in contact with them. So all this uh, planning for research activity is, has been slowed by all the documentation required. There's a lot of training that everyone has to do. Uh, we have to clean the laboratory regularly and so on. So it's a very, life is slower um, in terms of, <laughs> it seems that everyone is busy, but we have fewer results. So um, yeah. Now as, Dr. Novello mentioned, 
We have uh, similar problems in commercial operations. Um, in California, vineyard and winery operations have been allowed to continue uh, with various uh, requirements for distancing to reduce contact between workers. Um, tasting rooms are closed, so this has a huge impact on the income of wine, small wine companies. Uh, and also restaurants are closed, although there's now, they're starting to open, but um, this the reduction in the number of visitors and restaurants has had a very large impact on Napa Valley, Sonoma Valley, and other high quality coastal regions in California. Many of the small companies um, have their business is to sell wine directly to consumers out the door who visit their tasting rooms and also sell to restaurants. Well, those two uh, options are not available by and large. So many of the high quality companies are struggling if they don't have enough uh, reserve, um, financial reserves. So we expect that um, many of these companies will end up closing. Uh, we don't know yet exactly the impact, um, a lot of speculation. Um, but we expect this to have a long-term impact on the business. However, uh, because restaurants are closed, many people are buying wine, uh, more, much more wine from the shops. So the grocery store sales, wine shop sales are up a lot. Um, one of the uh, owners of, a, of a, a wine shop told me he's worried because his customers are buying so much wine, they're drinking too much. Um, so in fact, uh, in certain segments of the, of the market, uh, purchases are up and wine companies, certain companies are, are having trouble uh, uh, getting enough wine to sell. So at the low end of the market, the sort of moderate priced wine sales are actually up Whereas at the high end of the market, the wine, which is normally sold in restaurants for high prices, the sales are way down. Um, <clears throat> so it's, a, it's an uneven effect on different wine making operations. Um, <clears throat> so at this point, the restaurant business is starting to open. Um, in, for instance, in Davis, Restaurants are allowed to be open if they can serve outside. So you cannot serve food inside your business, but if you have seats outside, uh, then you can serve uh, at, at a table. Um, many restaurants are selling food uh, for takeout. So customers go to the restaurant, they pick up the food and they take it home. Uh, so the restaurant business is starting to function, but it's not normal. And in fact, um, <clears throat> a real question that's starting to come up is, will we ever return to normal? Um, there's some predictions that the economic change will be quite persistent uh, with the expectation that we will not achieve a normal restaurant activity maybe for many years. Um, so if that happens, um, then we can expect the wine business will be fundamentally changed, uh, for the next decade. Um, right now, the, we don't have specific predictions. Um, some people are making guesses, but the expectation is that many of the high priced wine companies will not succeed, that they will end up going out of business, um, and the reason is that the, the, their business model um, is based on uh, retail sales at the company, which means that um, the, they need to get the in full income of each bottle in order to be able to pay their workers and pay the mortgage, et cetera, 
and that will not be feasible. So the wine, the sale of the wine will have to be discounted, meaning that the income for their, for their sale of their wine will be less than they need to be a solvent business. So we expect that um, many of these companies that require uh, sales in the tasting room to consumers will not be able to um, continue business. So the very expensive wines will probably have to be um, reduce their prices to be successful. And so this will be a large impact on the, um, on the business of wine, uh, especially at the high end of the market for some time. Um, that may not, I mean, so that this, the, <clears throat> these um, dire predictions are based on the concept that the, the whole business, entertainment business, restaurant business is going to change in a dramatic way for the long term. Um, and I think there's some debate of whether this is really going to happen. So <clears throat> in summary, as everyone has the experience, we have limited in-person contact. Uh, we have to, which slows down research activity, teaching activity. We have to spend a lot of time uh, with sanitation practices and record keeping. So all business cost of business is, is increasing. Um, and in general, income is going down. So that means less profits uh, for companies. Um, and as I mentioned, I spent a lot of time explaining restaurant uh, expenditures will maybe down for a, a long period, which is going to have a large impact, sort of difficult to predict impact. Uh, but on the on the wine business um, and I think in California now many people are suggesting that expensive wines may have to be the businesses that produce those very expensive wines may have to reconsider their business model so I'd like to stop there sorry it's a bit of a dire consequences um, but I'm happy to take any questions you might have uh, at this time. Thank you very much, Andy. It's interesting to see that you have the same uh, rules or the same uh, uh, procedures than, uh, than us. We are really very, uh, very close in terms of obligation. Uh, maybe uh, if someone has some questions, they can ask. Uh, uh, one point is uh, how you you think the uh, wine production will be affected. So it will be much more uh, wine staying in the cellar, and uh, the price of the wine will decrease. Uh, and if the restaurant doesn't open, so the the sell will be uh, not enough important to for the production? Yes, so the, we're seeing that uh, overall sales are down, uh, but, the, 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 but the loss of sales is mostly at the high end of the market. So at the moderate price wine, so like um, that might sell for $10 per bottle, those wines are selling quickly. In fact, some companies that focused in this market, they're having trouble getting enough stock. So the wine is, uh, so it, the, the wine, the, the, the business is not going down completely, um, but it's, but the, the problem is the high priced wine is not selling. So those companies are struggling. Now, I'm, it was interesting because Dr. Novello is talking about of many regulations that are being adjusted to reduce production. And the, it's an interesting comparison because in California, we don't have such regulations. The yield is not regulated by the government. So there's really no change in regulations um, 
in, in this manner, right? I mean, the companies know they have to they have to reduce production, but the government is not regulating that. So it's really a market driven change. It's not a regulation, a regulated change in the market. Mm -hmm. So it's a voluntary uh, perspective, in fact. Um, right, each company has to make a decision. Yeah. What do we do with excess wine? Do we, and so what's happening, what's going to have to happen, and it hasn't started yet, but what'll happen is the, the, the high quality wine will be discounted, right? So, so someone who normally sells their Cabernet for $100 a bottle, right? They can't sell it. For the, they can't sell it mm -hmm. by the bottle. So they will sell that in bulk to a company for a discounted price. So their income for each bottle is much, much less. So they can sell it, mm -hmm. but they will sell it to be sold maybe for $20 a bottle. Someone else will sell it at $20 a bottle. So they will buy it in bulk for $5 a bottle, right? So you'll be, you'll be selling the wine for $6 a liter, which normally would sell for $100 a bottle, right? So the, the market will exist, but the income for that company now is much, much less. And so the, the companies which are normally selling in this high price are going to have a lot of trouble. I understand. And another, another point, is there uh, trouble for, uh, to do the transport of the wine actually uh, inside the United States or uh, it's, the transportation is not affected? I haven't heard of any, any difficulty with transportation. Um, okay. Yeah, that's, that's not, hasn't, hasn't really been a, a problem. Yeah. Uh, you have a question from a spectator saying, uh, in the current uncertain business environment, there might be any new business around wine market. Do you feel any new business opportunity around wine market in California? Well, um, it, it's possible um, it, in the, it may be possible to build some marketing direct to consumer. So there's uh, the growth in uh, internet sales of wine is dramatic, right? So there may be some opportunities there. Uh, I'm not sure what they are. Uh, there, there is an increase in sales of wine in cans and in boxes. I'm not sure that that's, um, anyone's going to make too much money on that, but uh, yeah, it's, no one has found, no one has found a way to make a lot of money right now. Yes. No. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Andy, uh, there is a last one and then we move to Zanzu presentation. Um, do you think that big company will gain even more market against small boutique winery? It's any, it's, uh, any government help to save that kind of business? Well, that's, that's happening right now, yes. I mean, it, it, the large companies are definitely able to uh, grow their sales because the sales are in that market. So the large companies sell to the grocery stores, they sell to the wine shops, and that sale is increasing. Um, the government help has not been directed at wine companies, but large, but there is help for small companies in all sectors. So, so yes, the government's helping the small companies in a general sense. Uh, there hasn't been a, there's there, and I don't, ex no one expects the government to specifically help um, wine companies in, in, in California or the U S yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Andy, and uh, thank you for the big effort to wake up so early. And uh, I, I hope that we will have time to meet again uh, as quick as possible.
Yes, I look forward to that, Pierre Louis. I hope we can meet uh, in a conference in in this, let's say, 2021. <laughs> yes, baby. <laughs> okay. Okay, Zanzu. Bye bye. Bye bye. Zanzu, it's now your turn. Okay, I uh, probably I will try it again, and uh, if it doesn't work, I will let you share the screen for me. Okay. So I will try because I transfer it to, to uh, PDF. Okay. It may work better. Uh, can you see it? Yes. I will move. Can you see the map? Yes, now yes. Okay, okay, great. Better. So <laughs> let, let's, let's try like this. So okay. I will. Probably I will I will continue uh, from where I I was uh, uh, stopped. So uh, this map show shows the the main wine producing region in China, and uh, we can see most of the uh, wine producing region are located in north of China, with the uh, continental climate, uh, which means uh, there there is quite a lot of rainfall during the summer and a very high temperature and a small temperature difference between day and night. But during the winter, we have a very low temperature and also dry uh, uh, air. So the temperature can go uh, as below to negative uh, 30 degree. So this uh, increase uh, a, a lot of a problem uh, the, the most important challenge for us is uh, we have to uh, cover the vines during the winter. So this, uh, this happened normally in uh, November and December. So this, this was not uh, influenced by the uh, virus. But what we have to do uh, is the action that we have to do during the spring. Uh, because the temperature increase is very fast and we have to uncover all the wines from the soil in a quite short period. And du during this period, this reaction is mainly done by um, uh, uh, farmers or we have to do it manually. So this uh, raised the big problem for uh, manpower as mentioned uh, by several times by other um, speakers, which means even though we are uh, far from harvest, but we already uh, experienced a lot of uh, problem for uh, manpower because of this special uh, manipulation uh, in spring. And, um, and this is the thing uh, that we, we have met in the industry. And I also want to share something happened in the lab. So uh, in the lab, we, we uh, I, I, I saw the, I, I, I noticed the presentation of uh, 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 Professor uh, Rothhaus. He said that he has to reduce the people uh, working in the lab. So what, what the situation in my lab is there's no, there's zero student since uh, the last, uh, uh, in, in, in fact, is uh, January. So what we found is uh, we lost all our cell uh, tighter, cell suspensions, uh, a lot of uh, contamination of uh, um, cell cells that we, uh, we are working on. And also, uh, since we have to postpone our uh, planting uh, work, we, we meet, uh, we have in the greenhouse uh, flowering during the very high temperature condition. So those give us very bad fruit set. This increase um, difficulties in addition to lack of uh, uh, students in the lab. So we are thinking about what could we do? So um, I think in end, uh, Around the end of uh, February, I think, I thought probably we could uh, start some projects uh, focus on data analysis and uh, data exploration uh, around the problem uh, whether we could uh, choose suitable grape cultivars for a new uh, wine producing region or country like uh, uh, China. So the, the starting point of this project is 
uh, we noticed that in fact the variety uh, distribution in China is uh, not very well balanced. If we look at uh, the distribution of wine uh, producing uh, varieties, we could see uh, Cabernet Sauvignon is the number one uh, variety. It, it accounts about 60% uh, of the uh, all varieties. While the situation in France is that we could see uh, there are uh, probably five or four, uh, five to six varieties to account for the first 50% uh, of the, uh, the production. So we see everywhere uh, Cabinet Sauvignon in China. We are asking the question whether Cabinet Sauvignon is really the suitable uh, grape cultivar for all the uh, wine producing regions. So first we uh, collected some uh, uh, climate data to verify uh, the uh, climate conditions in compared to uh, Bordeaux where uh, Cabernet Sauvignon is very suitable. So this is the uh, um, region from uh, in Shandong province. And uh, this line is for Bordeaux. If we look at the degree day accumulation over the season, we could see a very high uh, degree of accumulation in terms of temperature, which indicates a high temperature uh, for our situation. And uh, we also verified the Yuglan uh, index and also the gre uh, green season uh, average temperature. Uh, we could always say uh, the situation uh, we are uh, always uh, with a temperature higher than those uh, at Bordeaux. So uh, whether, since we, uh, we see a quite different uh, uh, climate condition, so uh, we are looking uh, for literature to find some uh, standards uh, for choose uh, suitable uh, group cultivars for new region. I know there are many uh, possibilities or there are many uh, reasons uh, to choose one a group cultivar for a specific region. But what I, I found in the literature, something interesting and simple is that uh, my, my colleague uh, Keith Van Leven wrote in a review that in traditional wine green regions of Europe, uh, gruners have uh, empirical use variability in phenology to adapt to cultivars to local climate uh, condition in order to maximize uh, Tihua expression. As a result in Europe, in fact, grape picking generally take place between uh, the 10th of September to the 10th of October, uh, despite uh, the huge climate differences. So I'm uh, asking the question, is this rule applicable to a new uh, green region? So uh, in fact, uh, I tried to test uh, these ideas with a very old data set. In 1944, uh, by uh, outstanding uh, professor uh, Amirin and also Winkler. Uh, Winkler, uh, in this report, they developed this Winkler index. And this studied, in fact, over seven years uh, from 1935 to 1941 uh, in uh, five regions of California. And then they studied uh, 148 cultivars. Uh, they uh, recorded very detailed harvest date, must, uh, sugar content, uh, organic acids, pH, and also they uh, analyzed the wines produced from those must uh, with the alcohol content, uh, acid, and also uh, interestingly, they, uh, they put some um, uh, wine tasting notes. And uh, um, my 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 idea is uh, whether we could reanalyze uh, those data sets uh, and uh, first probably uh, because the, this this report aims to uh, in fact uh, select some suitable uh, grape varieties for California 
uh, many, many years ago. And uh, I'm thinking whether we could uh, verify uh, the hypothesis that um, provided by Keith Wylevin in his literature. And if so, probably we can use uh, that standard as a, as a criteria to choose new varieties for our new region. So we, we started to digitalize uh, the tables. Uh, there are, there are um, 760 pages with a lot of uh, um, tables. So with uh, uh, a student, we digitalize all the tables and uh, we try to uh, look at the data, uh, try to extract uh, extract some interesting, interesting information. So here I will uh, just briefly uh, present some uh, uh, ongoing analysis. First, we, uh, we can uh, clearly see uh, the temperature accumulation uh, from flowering to harvest uh, over the five regions. In fact, this is the original uh, definition of the Winkler index where he uh, defined uh, the regions uh, or grouped the regions, regions into uh, five uh, categories uh, based on the temperature accumulation. In fact, this is a, uh, uh, a temperature accumulation from uh, 1st April to end of uh, October. And we could, what we could see is in fact, from region one to region five, there's a huge uh, difference in terms of uh, temperature uh, but from one year to another, uh, over the uh, seven years uh, they studied, the variability is rather small. There are only about 200 uh, degree of difference. The mainly different differences uh, across different regions. And in the data set, for example, Cabernet Sauvignon, they uh, planted uh, Cabernet Sauvignon in all the five regions and then followed those varieties over uh, five to seven years, that's, that's a really rich uh, uh, data set. But for some varieties, of course, they only planted in uh, three regions over three years. So uh, anyway, I think the data set is really rich. So the first thing we look at is the distribution of the musk and the wine chemical properties. We could see there's a very big uh, variability for all the uh, properties uh, that they measure. So for the master sugar, it can uh, uh, vary from uh, uh, 15 to 30. Uh, that's a very uh, big range. And also the acidity, uh, uh, must be, uh, we could see uh, those uh, properties. And also for the alcohol and also the acid in the, in the, in the, in the wine. And of course, we uh, verify the correlation uh, between uh, some uh, variables and uh, find some um, uh, expected correlation, like uh, the negative correlation between uh, uh, sugar and uh, uh, acid uh, in the mast. And this gives us a way to control, in fact, the, uh, whether we have some problem for uh, digitalization of data set. And uh, something interesting I, I want to um, uh, share with you is about this, uh, the distribution of uh, uh, phenology. In fact, uh, in this data set, the phenology, uh, the, the harvest uh, date uh, spent uh, within a very wide range from as early uh, in early August to uh, early December. And uh, my, uh, our question is if we look at uh, uh, the distribution of phenology for each uh, variety, whether we could find some um, uh, genetic differences uh, where we, we know uh, uh, well. So what we could see here is the uh, range for each uh, variety. We can see since some of, uh, some of the varieties, they were planted in uh, five different regions. So the harvest date uh, can vary uh, quite large, but basically we can see some genetic variability uh, in terms of uh, uh, the uh, harvest date. Those variabilities mainly determined by the, uh, the specificity of the variety. We could see some uh, early uh, ripening 
uh, varieties like uh, Pinot Noir, which is uh, here, it's among the most earliest uh, uh, ripening uh, varieties. And also we could find some late uh, ripening varieties uh, around here. So back to the hypothesis that uh, proposed by Case by Lemon is that uh, we select varieties to uh, put all the uh, maturity of uh, different cultivars uh, from different region uh, to the same window. So uh, to verify this, um, in the in the in the book, uh, the author recommended for each region some uh, uh, selected variety. So we checked their harvest date, which is here. So those are the uh, recommended uh, uh, varieties in different uh, regions. And uh, we can see surprisingly, in fact, those, the, the peak uh, harvest date over uh, five, seven years are relatively uh, the same. In fact, uh, which means all the, uh, the harvest of uh, all uh, different uh, cultivars uh, from different regions with uh, uh, huge difference in terms of uh, uh, temperature, they are harvest around the same date, uh, which uh, confirm uh, the hypothesis uh, that in fact we use the phenology viability uh, to make the uh, ripening happen uh, in a very uh, well-defined uh, window. So this is the most uh, exciting uh, information that we obtained from this data set. And we also looked, uh, checked the, the wine tasting notes for the cultivars recommended for each region. And uh, we, we made some uh, very simple uh, text mining for those uh, wine tasting notes. And uh, we found, um, in fact, uh, different, uh, different uh, keywords appear from uh, four different regions. Uh, some, for example, for the region four, uh, the fruity appeared uh, very frequently. And, uh, and also for the region five, uh, there's a, a color uh, appeared. Uh, we, are, we are thinking probably uh, these are mainly related to the different styles of wine uh, produced in uh, each region. And uh, we are still working on these uh, wine tasting notes. Uh, and um, and th those are the uh, preliminary uh, results that we obtained from this uh, rich data set. And uh, some perspective that we, uh, we want to apply uh, to, the, to, to our uh, region is we want to um, collect uh, climate condition data uh, for most of the wine producing region and then uh, collect uh, cultivar specificity, specificity uh, including phenology, uh, quality, and uh, different uh, 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 wine tasting uh, characteristics, and also uh, different viticulture practices. Try to uh, input all those information into a platform where we could predict the growth and quality of the grape berry. Uh, start with phenology and uh, also sh uh, sugars, uh, organic acids, colors, uh, probably dynings, aromas. And finally, uh, use those data to uh, make some uh, recommendation uh, for each wine producing region. And uh, if we obtain this information, then uh, we could uh, develop some collaboration with vendors to test those uh, varieties. And hopefully, uh, we can help to increase the diversity of uh, uh, the wine producing uh, cultivars in, in our industry. And that's some uh, perspective that we, we are thinking about. And uh, I, I, want to, I want to see that uh, we spend uh, quite a lot of time to digi uh, digitalize uh, the data set. We are ready to share this data set if anyone wish to uh, have a, a, a look at different angles. And uh, we are also happy to have more collaborations uh, to look at uh, this data set uh, together. And uh, hopefully we could find um, 
uh, extract more information from this uh, valuable data set. And uh, thank you for your uh, listening. Okay, thank you very much, Zanzu. So you have two questions. One is uh, uh, nice talk, thanks. Uh, what do you think about the use of different bootstock to achieve a better terroir adaptation and expression of foreign grade varieties? Uh, I, I didn't mention uh, the rootstock because currently we uh, in China, most of the vineyards, uh, we don't use uh, rootstock. There are two reasons. Because, because of this very harsh winter, uh, we think the, the um, uh, Philoxiha cannot finish his, uh, uh, his uh, life cycle. So uh, the, the risk, risk is rather low. The second problem is uh, more technical because uh, with the grafted uh, plants, uh, when we cover uh, them uh, during the winter, we have to bend uh, the, the wine, uh, the shoot. And during this bending, uh, very often uh, the wine will be broken at the graft uh, union. So this uh, has largely uh, impacted us to use uh, grafted uh, uh, plants, but I think uh, uh, for 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 some region in north in south of uh, China there are some region uh, probably be, uh, with a very moderate uh, temperature uh, we don't need to cover them during the winter. In those regions, I think we really have to think about rootstocks, and uh, I know there are many possibilities uh, to regulate quality phenology with uh, rootstock. But that's a uh, that's, uh, uh, direction we haven't uh, paid too much attention for. And I think we don't have uh, really enough quantitative data to make some uh, model uh, to evaluate the effects. So it's a case by case uh, uh, effect, in fact. Okay, and uh, a second one from Liliana Martinez. Which is the wine consumption per person in China and what kind of uh, wine Chinese prefer? Chinese people prefer. In, in fact, the, the volume is uh, very low. It's lower than wine. I think it's one point, uh, it's uh, uh, probably lower than two. I think it's 1.2 or, or something like that. Very, very low, the average value because we have a very uh, big population. But I think for wine lovers, Probably they drink a lot, but uh, when we divide it with our population, we, the average is uh, extremely low. And, uh, and, uh, and for the wines, I think most people prefer red wine. This is uh, um, mainly, probably mainly uh, uh, due to the promotion uh, strategy initially uh, defined by the uh, wine uh, producers, they, they always um, promote the red wines with the healthy benefits. So people believe uh, drink red wine can um, become healthy. Um, so that's, that's one of the reasons. Uh, red wine, I think, is the okay. preference. Thank you very much, Zanzu. So we have no more questions and I would like to Thanks uh, all the <laughs> professors uh, and uh, persons that have uh, give, been giving the talk, all the participants that uh, were asking questions and what they were uh, following us. Uh, I will just ask one thing to all of you, to everybody, participants and uh, people that were giving talk, you can start your video uh, now and then, uh, like that, uh, Agat Derry will be able to do a picture with all participants uh, to have a memory, and she will be able to share with all of you. So, uh, if you if you can uh, uh, start your video, it should be very nice to have a memory about this uh, special event that we had today, and uh, we hope all of us that uh, we can share a real glass of wine next time, of course, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, to celebrate uh, real interaction between us, not uh, in virtual, but uh, in presential 
uh, that will be more fun. Thanks to all. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I see that there is maybe some question. Alors, Marianne McKay saying, thank you for the great symposium. So thank you, Marianne, to say to us that the symposium was nice and that you like it. So we hope that it will be useful for everybody. So Talita say also thank you to all. Thank you. I got, is it okay for you? Do you have, uh, can you do the picture? Yes, I have what I need. Thank you. <laughs> you have everything? Okay, it's perfect. Okay, so in this case, thanks again. And uh, to all the friends and participants, so I say bye-bye. And uh, we will meet again for sure. We will find time to have events. Hey, thank you very much to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Ciao, ciao. Ciao, ciao. Bye, bye. Ciao. Ciao. <laughs>